your host, Tyler Oltoff. Along with me is Kyle Wakeling. Hey, this is Kyle, your editor at large for the Vita Lounge. And also Brian Sharon. Hey guys, welcome to episode two. Also John Harding Rathbone. Hello, good evening, and welcome to episode two. And he wasn't here last week, but we also have Jasper Bakima. Hi. You totally pronounced my last name wrong, but I don't care. <laughs> Glad to be on there. <laughs> I'll get it one day. <laughs> Maybe. Better. You can just call me out on it every time I do it wrong. All right, and then we have new releases with Brian. So take it away, Brian. All right, let's just jump right into the new releases this week. Hot off the presses from North America this week, we have Angry Birds Star Wars and Crazy Market. Does anybody here have right. oh. So what, what is Crazy Market? Because I, I heard about it, but I honestly have no idea what it's about. By name alone, it sounds like the sequel to Crazy Taxi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm in control of a market and things get crazy is what you're saying. Yeah, so I guess nobody played it? It's on my Vita, never, but I haven't yeah. actually bothered to sort of turn it on. <laughs> yeah, but it was free, so I thought I might as well download it. As yeah, far as yeah. I can tell, it's a supermarket simulator. Basically, you're buying <laughs> things or something. I, I don't know, really. <laughs> is there a goal? <laughs> I sure hope so. Avoid 80-year-old women. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I can do that. Is it extreme couponing? Is that what it is? (laughs) Find the quickest line. (laughs) Okay, I have to finish this list, okay? So we got OMG, AC Zombies. It's basically a chain chain game. So you have to make chains of zombies who shoot each other. So you're a military guy, and... Well, you stand on a high place in the surroundings and you shoot a zombie and that zombie explodes and all other zombies die. And you basically cause a chain reaction. The goal of the game is to cause all zombies in the level to die. It's a nice game, though it looks a bit boring. It's very, very grayish and the only real color is red. And, huh. and there is, well, sound is bad. <laughs> but it's okay. It's it's okay. It's it's not the greatest game ever, and some levels are really just horrendous. Yeah, it's 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 okay. But who do you okay. recommend it for? Who do I recommend it for? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, probably people who like to grind, who like to grind. Like physically grind on, on the dance yeah. floor. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a different type of grind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I get confused. Grind. Yeah, it's not really the traditional RPG grind, but it's you have to upgrade your zombies a lot in order to make it in certain levels. So I think that's who it's for. People who like to do the same thing over and over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very repetitive. I think. I'm not sure whether it's the PlayStation mobile version or or it was a mini, one or the other. Um, and I yeah. I played it and I played it for about ten levels and it, it was quite fun to begin with with all the effects. But then it gets very old quite quickly. I found. Yeah, I mean there's different types of zombies uh, who explode and kill other zombies in different types of way. So that's how it stays sort of fresh. But because zombies are mostly generated randomly through the level so i mean the type of zombies are set but where they spawn isn't exactly set makes it kind of a game dependent on luck so you have to just be lucky that some of the zombies are in the right place otherwise you're never going to make it that's a drawback to it yeah that kind of sucks yeah but it's it's a it's a it's a fun game but it's not anything exceptional i would say it's good but not great so would you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down Three eager thumbs thumbs up, but it's all right. Okay. Okay. We have another game that came out this week. Uh, that's coming out this week in both North America and Europe. It's Proteus, which Paul Murphy, our own Paul Murphy, uh, reviewed. Does anybody have yeah. anything to say about it? Uh, I did play it uh, when I was in PAX Prime down in Seattle, oh, and really? yeah, it's it's fun, but it's weird. Like you don't really have a goal, but I only played like five minutes, so I mean there could be more stuff to it. But it's very pretty looking, like. It looks great on the Vita, and I enjoyed it for what I played. But that's really all I got. <laughs> it kind of reminds me a little bit of LSD on the PlayStation 1. I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard of it, but if you look it up on YouTube, it's... I have never done LSD, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I mean, it, it's basically a game about tripping, and it's random every single time you play it, and you can walk through walls and go into different areas. And I suppose, in a way, Proteus kind of looks like it has 
the same principle at heart. You know, you don't know what the hell's going on. You don't know what the hell to do. So you just kind of become like a child again and discover and, you know, look around and, and take the world in. Yeah, I think that's what Paul said in his review, too. He said, well, this was a throwback to my youth. Well, the visuals and the chirpy tunes and the expensive exploration, it reminded him of a trip with his grandparents. That's what he said. He said it didn't, it wasn't too long and the price point was a bit high compared to, for example, the PC version. But he thought it was good. And if I'm looking at the screens, I'm of course not seeing it in motion yet, but it looks good too. It's, it's got that, well, that indie vibe, you know, not very high resolution, but very colorful and very playing towards the emotions. I think that's what this yeah. game does. And that's what Paul liked about it too. Yeah. So I'm going to say this. It looks like the nicest artist went to MS Paint and he made his masterpiece. Yeah. That's the visual, that's the visual style. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree with that. And you can find a review on the site, of course, by Paul Murphy, the founder. Kyle, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, just reading his review about Gather, it's a game about discovery. Really, it's about, like, affecting your environment in, like, the slightest way to make changes. And that's what the game is about. It's about exploration. Have yeah, any of you guys taken a look at the live action trailer for the game that went live? I haven't had a chance to watch that yet. I'm sorry. Hey, no. uh, hey, you guys, <laughs> way to go, guys. Anyway, <laughs> going back to what's new, uh, if you're looking for something a little lighter in your wallet this week, uh, Horror Week Part 2 continues, but only one game of note is uh, on this week, which is Lone Survivor, which is a psychological horror game. Uh, which has dropped from its regular price of twelve ninety nine to nine ninety nine on the PSN store, but it's also eight ninety nine for PlayStation Plus subscribers. And also, I wanted to mention that Bullet Hell Shoot 'Em Up Cinemora has been added to the Instant Game Collection and is free for PlayStation Plus subscribers. Yeah, it's a it's a shoot 'em up, sure, and it's it's quite good. It's it's basically not just a simple throwback to old shoot 'em ups because it it uses different mechanics. It's it's about time control, basically. Time control is you have a timer that runs down, and you have to shoot enemies and dodge hits in order to stay alive. So it's not just if you get hit three times, you're out. Sometimes it can take ten hits to kill you, and at other times, a one hit KO, basically. And yeah, it's it's quite fun. The visuals are very very good. The effects look nice. The only problem is that sometimes on a small screen. Um, the background blends in a bit with the foreground because there will be planes flying towards you from the background into the foreground and you can't exactly tell when they will be entering the foreground and the boss fights are absolutely amazing in the game they're sort of really staged so you're attacking different parts of the boss and then another part basically opens up and it's got a traditional bullet hell feel really that you've you have to slow down time and getting bullets all over your face. It's, it's amazing. And very colorful. <laughs> very colorful bullets. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. If, you, if you're a smut fanatic, I wouldn't play it because it has randomized drops. And huh. I shall explain it to the non smut fanatics. Randomized drops means that you can't know the exact route to the best score. And that's what smut fanatics often like in all the smut games. Okay. So if you like getting a high score, then maybe play another older smug, which is catered to watch that. This game yeah. is okay at it. All right, well, that's good to know. All right, so let's uh, head over to the news with John. Take it away. Okay, so this week, our first topic is going to be the Vita TV again. I know that we did talk about it last week, but since then we've had some new screenshots come through of it actually being play-tested. So just to recap... The Vita TV plays PlayStation Vita on your TV, uh, but it also plays the PlayStation 4 by remote play. It plays PlayStation 1 classics, and it plays all the PSP games that you can already access on your Vita. We've since discovered that we don't think that PlayStation Mobile, however, will be appearing on it, because there's a screenshot from the Japanese PlayStation Network that... Um, Basically doesn't show it on there. I mean, I can't, I can't read <laughs> the uh, writing in Japanese, but I, I do believe that it seems to be missing. 
The yeah. menu screens have also been covered. You can uh, hook up two DualShock 3s at once, and it also seems that you'll be able to hook up an external keyboard as well, which has significance because obviously Sony are looking to market it as not just as a Vita TV, but also as an all-in-one media device. The, um, the L3 and R3 buttons can be mapped to touch controls as well on a PlayStation Vita if you're hooking that up to it. Now, there's been a couple of images of the PlayStation 4 remote play. They've been playing Knack on it, and although it only shows it in 720p, they have been uh, reporting that there's no lag whatsoever, and that also 1080p and 720p, there's not really much of a difference, or you can't really notice the difference as if um, you were playing it on an actual PlayStation 4. The screen resolution that you can set it to, it, it can either be automatic, it can be 480p if you have a really old TV, it can be 720p and it can also be 1080i. It doesn't do 1080p, but whether that actually will make that much of a difference in practice, um, we'll have to see at a later date. They also showed God Eater 2 on a 64-inch 4K TV, so it was upscaled by the TV itself, um, it's about nine times the resolution of your standard HD TVs. And to be honest, I think it looks really good. I mean, it's difficult to see from the screenshots because obviously it's off screen, but it, it looked really quite clear and we were quite surprised really because, I mean, last week we were talking about Killzone Mercenary and whether that would look quite as um, amazing and impactful on a big TV. And to be honest, it looks like, you know, it, it's looking really positive. What do you guys think? I haven't really seen too many screens. I have seen a couple from, uh, I think it was Tokyo Game Show, where they had a couple screens. But, yeah, I would like to see it in person mainly before I start judging it and really deciding whether or not I think it's worth having myself. But one of the things that you were talking about was uh, the external keyboard. And I'm kind of curious, like, with all these things that they're adding to the Vita TV, do you think any of these things are going to work for the regular Vita? Like, I think it'd be interesting to hook up an external keyboard to my own Vita and browse the web using a keyboard on the Vita. I don't know if that would be useful or not, but it's something that would be pretty interesting if they added. Yeah, I mean, it's, I suppose it's kind of it's kind of um, trying to blur the lines between what is a handheld console and what is a, a full console, if you like. So, yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what direction it goes in. Well, on a 99 dollar devices basically that you can do so many things next to yeah. all, also watching TV that surprised me but I'm not a TV watcher at all but well, <laughs> seems cool so, yeah. actually I, since Jasper chimed in I wanted to get his opinion because he wasn't here for the first episode where we talked about whether we would be purchasing the device had it come to the west and Jasper is it something you see yourself using if it does come to Europe? Well I don't have my own TV at the moment but once I do have basically uh, my own setup, I would consider it. It seems interesting. It also looks good. <laughs> <laughs> and it's cheap. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's cheap. That's, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, I mean, I guess the reason that it is so cheap could possibly be due to the fact that it obviously it doesn't have its own screen to house so the OLED we know was one of the major components of the cost of the Vita hence why the LCD screen is now on on the um, the new model so I guess that's probably why they managed to keep the cost down so much but I can't imagine they're making much of a profit on it but then I suppose they maybe won't be looking at making a profit at the moment it's it's important that they sell as many as possible yeah, yeah. maybe they're trying to make a profit of software well, no, actually, there's peripheral um, profits to be made because if you buy a Vita TV, the chances are of you just buying the Vita TV itself are very slim. Odds are yeah. you're going to either own a Vita or buy a Vita to go along with it. So in that sense, you're already engaged in the marketplace. So you're going to be spending your money in the PSN store, on PlayStation games, on PlayStation hardware, and so on. And that, that means the PlayStation 4 or PlayStation Vita. So in one way or another, they're going to get you with the PS Vita TV. In one way, it's a foot in the door for them. Yeah, yeah. and a, and a, du and a dual shock controller of course mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you basically need that to play with it and a really expensive memory card <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's yeah, also yeah. true okay so moving on to the next news article this week is 
uh, the PlayStation 4 Day 1 update. It's called Update 1.50. The reason that it's relevant to us is because of the features that are going to be coming with it for the connectivity. Just from uh, from Sony's press release, the, the, the two main features, if you like, I'm just going to read out what it says. Um, it says, Remote Play. Users will be able to access PlayStation 4 titles displayed on their living room TVs and play them on a PS Vita system over Wi-Fi networks by using the PS4 Link app. Depending on network environment or titles, remote play performance may vary outside of the home. We anticipate that most PlayStation 4 titles will be playable on the PlayStation Vita system through remote remote play. The latest PlayStation Vita system software version to be released soon will be required to use the PlayStation 4 link. I mean, the significance of this, I, I suppose, is that you're looking at remote play and... When the PSP was released originally, they were saying that remote play was something was going to happen with that, and it never really did. And this basically finally confirms in concrete that pretty much every game, except for those that are reliant on things like the PlayStation 4i, should work um, fairly seamlessly. And also, outside of the home, they, they were very sketchy on whether you'd even be able to do it outside of the home, and it's looking like it is, although, as it says, the, the quality is going to vary. The other um, thing of note is the second screen. And this says, users can use the PS4 Link application for the PS Vita system and PlayStation app for iPhone, iPad and Android-based smartphones and tablets to use the devices as second screens and supported titles. PlayStation app has the ability to enable users to interact with games with their mobile devices. For example, on the Playroom, a title pre-installed in all PlayStation 4 systems that requires PlayStation camera, users can draw pictures on their mobile device screens and flick them towards the TV. The images then appear as a 3D object within the game. So it's all, again, it's it's more on connectivity, and I actually think that that's, it's quite an interesting thing. I mean, the second screen thing, it's it's been touched upon before um, in in certain previous games, but as far as linking the PlayStation Portable with the PlayStation 3, when it never it never really took off, um, so I think that this is going to be one to watch. Um, the app is due to come out on Android and iOS on the 13th of November, so it's going to be released before the PlayStation 4. And uh, Shuya Yoshida has also said that it's coming to the Vita before the PlayStation 4 launch in the next firmware update, but. As of yet, we don't have a concrete date for that. Now, the PlayStation 4 app, I've, I've got a brief overview of it. Uh, there's the remote play in the second screen, things that I've already mentioned, but it also allows you to do things like check your profile, you can go through your trophy list, you can exchange messages between the PlayStation 4, PS3 and Vita, you can browse the PlayStation Store and website as well, so you can go on and actually make purchases through this application, meaning that you'll be able to access it through your mobile phone if you have a fancy. Um, you can also spectate PlayStation 4 games, which I believe is going to be connected to Twitch TV, and uh, there's one more feature which I actually think is really good is you can you can use your phone or Vita as a keyboard and remote control for the PlayStation 4, which if the PlayStation 4 becomes, you know, your um, media hub of choice, the, the browser has always been a bit picky, especially with the PlayStation 4 controller. It takes ages to write any website <laughs> in. So I think that I think it's um, definitely very promising. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, I think it's really good that they are getting that update day one to use the remote play because a lot of people bug me on twitter and everywhere else saying like hey what's up with remote play like when i went to uh once again bringing up pax prime people were bugging me to get uh remote play uh footage and whatnot but they didn't have anything there they didn't talk about it at all so a lot of people were wondering is it going to work i mean when is it coming is it going to be a year down the road before we see the first thing actually working so it's good to see that they're showing that, you know, day one, we're going to be able to do stuff with remote play and the app and whatnot. Yeah, I was skeptical about it at first, because I thought, well, it's going to be a bit like PS3 all over again, but now that I see this, basically update day one, lots of titles will be working with it. I think it's going to be pretty cool, even though, well, I won't be owning a PS4 for at least a few years, I think. But I'm still yeah. excited for it. I think it could bring a lot of 
much needed support to the feet. For sure. Uh, I just remember playing on PlayStation 3 with the PSP remote play. Uh, some of the earlier games, like Lair and stuff like that, just how they introduced it. At first, it didn't run very well, but after like quite a bit of tweaking, uh, the game seemed to run quite well, even over distances, because uh, about a year ago, I was in the States, and I still had my PSP, and I tried from, I believe I was in Pennsylvania, all the way to my house, uh, remote play PS p on layer and it worked completely fine i didn't experience very much lag at all uh it didn't take like super long to connect or anything like that and i was running off wi-fi that wasn't very good either it was tim hortons Ooh. yeah <laughs> the yuki is also with us in the text chat he says that he hopes the new remote play works better than the ps3 one which was somewhat screwed up with the limited game library so that that was also a problem that there were titles that big titles not working on remote play. I have to Sorry. agree with that. I mean, I did. I, I had to sell my PlayStation Three because of my money, unfortunately. But when when I did have it, I had PlayStation One titles on the PlayStation Three because I thought to save space on my Vita, if I if I just have them on my PlayStation Three and then stream via remote play, I'm going to have much more space for Vita games. And in practice, to be honest it didn't work very well for me at all. My Wi-Fi connection is is pretty strong, and I had to, like, with the remote play on the PlayStation 3, with the image quality, you have, like, a plus one, zero, and a minus, you know, so that you can, if you've got latency issues, you can reduce the image quality. And even with the image quality on really, really low, I still noticed quite a lot of lag. Um, When I was playing Spyro, I couldn't make uh, accurate jumps and things like that. So, to be honest... It didn't. It didn't really work that well. However, the PlayStation 4, they keep saying, was designed alongside the Vita, so presumably these problems won't exist. I was kind of kept quiet, but uh, I think the lead designer on the Vita uh, is the same as the lead designer on the PS4, but they really touted him as the lead designer on the PS4 uh, without really mentioning him in the PS Vita design cycle. But I think, well, obviously... They designed it kind of for the Vita, kind of for the PS4, because that's really where the focus lies. And device connectivity, into device con- connectivity, you see that now with PCs and smartphones. And Sony, Sony aren't dumb. They know that they have to catch up with that. And well, they tried basically PlayStation Mobile. It didn't take off so well. So now we'll have this with two dedicated Sony devices working together. Yeah, yeah. Mark's, Mark certainly was at the helm of both the PlayStation Vita and the PlayStation 4. But besides remote play, besides second screen, I think that what's lost in this whole uh, report is that party chat is coming to both PlayStation Vita and PS4, which means you guys can chat across games um, with all your friends. It doesn't matter what you're playing. So... I think that's a big deal. I think that having an integrated system like that where you can speak to friends and, and live it up in a party chat is, is bringing the environment of the PlayStation Network to more people. Uh, that was a big problem with the PlayStation 3 is that party chat and group chat wasn't available across multiple games, and now we're having it across multiple platforms, which is a huge deal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I never use party chat. <laughs> but, I, get yeah, it I, I get it. I get it. That's one of the big things that Xbox Live users liked, a chat cross-game chat. <clears throat> I used to actually play mainly Xbox 360 back Boom. before I even... <laughs> I Get know, out. Know. Back... <laughs> All right, podcast over. See you guys. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> before I even knew about the Vita even coming out, I was a big Xbox person, and Party Chat was awesome, and I would be in games, different games than all my friends, and we'd just be talking crap the whole time <laughs> while we're playing different games and it was awesome and when i got the vita and heard that it had party chat you know i was like this is great this is exactly what a handheld needs and it does what it does and it works and i'm glad they're making them both work together because i could picture a lot of ps4 owners not even knowing what the vita is and one of their friends decides to jump in their party and has a vita and he looks at him playing some crazy vita game that he's never heard about and he's like wait what's that and you know Right there, he wants to go get a Vita. Yeah, you know, I think I think I could help. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's definitely an inclusive feature. Um, it it makes everybody it doesn't matter what PlayStation 
hardware you own, it makes you part of the environment. It makes you part of the habitat. Right. It makes you a PlayStation owner, which makes the entire experience seamless. So, yeah, I agree with right. you. Right. Well, thank you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Hugs all around. <laughs> the thing the thing for me is, and I think Sony has been very clever at this as well, is the fact that a lot of people have families and a lot of people have children. And so, you know, the, there's a certain time of the day which is going to be like family watching TV program times. And so if you have a PlayStation 4 and you want to play it all the time, like we all do, <laughs> um, <laughs> then so, you're going to be able to still yeah. carry on with your PlayStation Vita and ju- just hook it up by a remote play. So some people will be looking at the PlayStation 4 and then thinking, ah, even when the kids are watching their cartoons, I can still play on it. So I think some people will be buying it for that reason as well. Yeah, yeah. that's a very good point. Anything else, uh, John, for the news? We're looking at, it's a little bit of a, a rumour territory really, but we're looking at Persona. Um, we're looking that they've, they've recently shipped 300,000 units, although we don't know how many sales have actually been on the PlayStation Network, so we're thinking it could be more. Now, I know video game charts is not accurate when it comes to numbers. I mean, it's, it currently says 490,000, so we know it's, it's quite far off the mark. But interestingly, Persona 4 Golden is the fourth best-selling title you know, across the entire Vita library on their website. And I would, I would have the guess to say that that's a, reasonable, a reasonably accurate estimate. Um, Uncharted is number one, of course, uh, being the yeah. big blockbuster. But you know, Persona hasn't been out for as long, and it's it's performed really, really well, and it continues to sell solidly, you know, month on month in the PlayStation Network as well. It's always featuring, you know, reasonably high in the charts. And given, I mean, I don't know what it's like for you guys in the US, but over here in Europe, I've had zero marketing whatsoever. The only reason I knew about the game is from, you know, reading reviews and things like that about it. Um, But to to look at the figures, I mean, last week we were talking about how 300,000 units is, is nothing when we were talking about Raymond Legends. But to put it in a bit of perspective... The PlayStation 2 version that it's obviously a remake of sold 400,000. Now, that works out, given the PlayStation 2 install base, Kyle worked this out, thank you very much, um, <laughs> roughly 15 people in every 5,000 bought the PlayStation 2 version, whereas the Vita, it's actually 5%, which is you know 1 in 20 units. So, theoretically, most Vita owners uh, you know, have bought it and played it. Um, but the other thing to touch on as well is the website that's popped up. It's p-ch.jp. It's got a date on it of the 24th of November 2013, and it lists six cities and has three square boxes with crosses running through them. And at the moment, we can only really speculate as to what it means, but it's obviously Persona-related. Now, the series director, Katsura Hashino, was questioned about it, and he said, Are you curious? You're curious, right? I think we'll deliver news that will certainly please the fans. So a lot of people are thinking Persona 5, maybe? What do you guys reckon? Yeah, I think it's something big, obviously, because they're getting all this teasing going on, which is making me mad, because I really love Persona 4. And it's one of the games I convince everyone to buy when they pick up a Vita is get that, because it's one of the best games, in my opinion, on the Vita. Yeah, and I think it's the only one which, which has a perfect score on our site right now. Yeah. I, it's, I hope it's Persona 5, and if not, I'll be disappointed. But as long as it comes to the Vita, whatever it is, I'll be happy. <laughs> Kyle, but do you have anything to say? Yeah, <laughs> being that it was number one on our uh, top 25, I, I think that it has a good chance of... Uh, getting another Persona title coming soon. Even if it's not, like, announced uh, on the 24th when they announce whatever this is, I definitely think that there's a good possibility that we'll get one. Now, whether that's going to be Persona 3 Sapphire or we're going to get a new Persona 5 title, I'm not sure. Uh, I'd welcome either, but... What's Persona 3 Sapphire, then? I've not heard of that. Uh, People have been talking about Persona 3 Sapphire. uh, Just like a redone version like Persona 4 Golden of Persona 3 for the Vita. Uh, it has, yeah, which it, be... It's not like a solid title or anything, it's just speculation, but that's what a lot of people are hoping is coming. Oh, yeah, yeah, that could yeah. be, because you had basically Persona 3 FES, 
and that was also sort of a thing. But Persona 3 is still quite alive. Yeah, there's still anime things going on, and well, it's still a great game. It's, and well, JRPGs tend to stay alive quite a lot, quite quite a long time. I'm sorry, people tend to remember re- remember them. So yeah, they also have the the Persona 3 movie that's coming out. Um, I think it's really close to when this announcement is coming out. I can't remember what the exact release it's date, the day but before. the day before. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, there, that's coming out, which I'm. You know, it, just because of that, it could be something that involves Persona 3 because they have the movie coming out and that's kind of, they kind of want to hit the heels on that right there. It's just, hey, we got the movie, we got another game, it's coming to the Vita, yeah, everyone cheers. <laughs> and then, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Well, if it would be Persona 5, I, I, I think well, the Persona 3 thing is quite convincing, but if it would be Persona 5, I don't think it would imme- immediately come to the Vita because... That's not how other Persona titles have been released in the past. Time for change, Jasper. Time for change. Yeah, time for change. I would say so too. Uh, <laughs> now that we have a like, be- uh, handheld that can actually, you know, put out some power. The PSP was good, but really the the quality of the graphics on the titles and just like the expansiveness of the titles themselves were quite small compared to what you get on the Vita. So it's, yeah. it's, now that we have the technology, why not, right? Yeah, I yeah, say exactly. Persona also doesn't need a lot of power. It's, yeah, unless they have big ambitions for Persona 5, then they might need a lot of power. Who knows? Now that the PlayStation 4 is coming out, if this is a PlayStation 4 title, they could make this new uh, Persona series just crazy gigantic. But I think I think it's coming to the Vita. I mean, I have high hopes, and if it's not, then I'm gonna f- buy a ticket and fly to Kyle's house, and I'm gonna punch him in the face, and then I'm done. <laughs> my well, life, because he will kill yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I think that I doubt they really have the budget to make it a huge game, because well, they yeah. have 300,000 chipped for this game. Then a Persona game hasn't sold over a million yet. If I'm correct, am I correct? I would have no idea, but yeah, I, I think, feel like we'd know if yeah, it did. <laughs> Yuki, Yuki says I'm correct. So I doubt they have the big budget to pull off something like an open world game, to, just to say. Yeah. I think, so I think That's it true. would work on Vita. I would love but, to see uh, Vita. But yeah, Persona but, really isn't about big budget. It's about the story, right? Like you're going yeah, for the story that that's draws that's you that. in. So it doesn't need to be big budget to be a big game. And big right. is relative. Like 300,000 on the Vita is pretty big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I says too. Uh, I meant that if there, that means in terms of story, it's big. So that's why it would fit on Vita because there's no really no limits to what story you could tell on the Vita. So it wouldn't right. need to be on PS4 to be big. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I mean the PlayStation Portable actually became a home for this sort of RPG as well, which I don't think anybody really saw coming given the fact that it was a portable handheld but there's there's so many good RPGs that came out for the PlayStation Portable it would it would make sense for the Vita to be a natural home for it as well um although I've got to admit I haven't played Persona 4 Golden yet so you're a criminal <laughs> <laughs> I just I just haven't had the money or or the time to get round to it I definitely will play it I definitely will but at the moment it's it's not been at the forefront of my radar and I'm I'm sorry for that guys I yeah. believe Yuki wants to burn you for heresy. <laughs> I, I, yeah, fair enough. I, I agree. You probably should. <laughs> the, the other, the other thing that worries me though is, didn't uh, Atlas get taken over by Sega? Is, am I, am I right on that? Yeah, by yeah. Sega Sammy. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah, it's Sega Sammy. So it's the parent company who has a reputation for you know buying up companies and leaving them to their own devices, just funding them and making money off them. So we could see. So hopefully Atlas this doesn't change. Still being Atlas. Okay. All right, that's good. I was getting a little worried, which I think a lot of people on the internet were getting a little worried as well when they heard about this news. So hopefully nothing changes and Alice does what they need to do. All right, is there anything else anyone wants to add to the Persona talk? No, 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 please. nope, um, no. Okay, uh, is there anything else you have, John, in the news? Um, we're going to move forward. The last, the last bit of news. I mean, we've got Destiny of Spirits and we've got Starlight Inception, both of which have had. Betas um, recently. The Destiny of Spirits beta is the one that I've played. Obviously, it was it was 
available to PlayStation Plus subscribers in Europe, and I believe the codes went out for selected North American users. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's a free-to-play role-playing game, although, to be honest, from my impressions of it, it plays a little bit more like, I suppose, like Pokemon meets trading card game. Um, <laughs> the... Beta is from 6 a.m. on the 24th of October to 6 a.m. on Friday the 1st of November, as far as Europe is concerned. I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but my initial opinions were that the tutorial was overly long. I, I found that some of the the writing of, of the, the pixie fairy, whatever you want to call a character, wasn't that brilliant, and I found it got boring very quickly, and subsequently deleted it within about an hour of actually playing it. I just found that the battles themselves were far too automatic. Like, that, you know, you, you have abilities that you can use, but you have a little bar. And once you've used, a, you know, uh, when I was playing it at least, there was like two abilities I could use, and then I would not be able to do anything else for the rest of the battle, except select which um, which enemy I would want to target and even then the fighting was automatic although I could be wrong I could be wrong what do you guys no no, no that's, that's <laughs> how it works basically yeah it's automated automated it works basically like the older Final Fantasy games in that it is timing based so some characters move quicker than others but yeah there's basically your standard automatic attack which you're right about and then you can use some special attacks as well which and they are used immediately, but they consume well spirit points or something. I don't know what it's called. Now that's how it works. So not too big yeah. on it either. Either it's uh, it looks good. I would I, I'd say that the sprites look good, but yeah, uh, I don't know how well it's gonna do. I mean, when I played it, I enjoyed it a little bit, and then within a few minutes, I was starting to get bored. And now looking at it on my home screen, I'm like, do I want to play it? No, not really. So I don't know how long it's going to last. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that really want to play it, that, you know, really champion it and say that it's a great game and, you know, it works for me. And, I mean, it's just not for me right now. But they could add features that would maybe pull me back in, but we'll see. I had a a couple weird problems with it, actually. The first time I booted it, it wouldn't let me select anything on the touch screen, Uh, even though, like, if you hit the PlayStation Home button, and backed out, I could use the touchscreen fine. It just wouldn't work in the game. I ha- actually had to turn my Vita off to get it to, to register again. And then when I got back in the game again, it had touchscreen errors again, only it was, like, non-calibrated. Didn't matter where I touched or anything like that. It would not register where I was touching. I'd have to touch off the bubble or off what, what I was selecting to actually select what I wanted, so... Uh, I don't know yeah. if that was the, in the actual game or if it was something to do with my Vita, although I haven't had that problem with anything else. So. Has yeah. anybody else had that wrong? Oh. I no, haven't uh, had that problem, haven't. but deleting it was actually a bit, a bit of a nightmare. I don't know why. I just <laughs> When it comes to obviously different games take different levels of time to delete, but it, it took like 20 minutes. I actually thought I was going to have to hard reset my Vita to get it off. Well. <laughs> Oh, Maybe well. they encoded that in the beta so you wouldn't get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> See what happens when you delete our game. <laughs> I think I've spent probably the most amount of time with it because I'm currently writing the preview for the game, for the beta. And I'll tell you the truth. When I first jumped into it, I jumped into that atrocious tutorial. And that thing is lengthy and confusing as hell. Um, I think I was talking to Kyle right when I was playing the tutorial. I told him this has to be the worst game I've ever played. Uh, because that tutorial, it, it's overly complicated. The, the game is very simple. If you've played Pokemon, it's, a, it's very simple to po- uh, similar to Pokemon. You capture spirits, you sum- or you summon them in this case, and you battle them in elemental battles where you have a, a, a different version of the rock, paper, scissors mechanic. And it's very simple. But the, the tutorial makes it overly complicated, and it will for sure become a barrier to entry for anybody trying to enter the, the beta. Um yeah. As for as for everybody else saying um, that they didn't have fun, I completely understand. It's, ver- it's a very simple game. But I will say this. As somebody who spent probably the most amount of time with the game, it slowly does add in layers. Um, Jasper was saying that the automatic timer pops in and you have two special moves. That's true. However, 
the game has a huge integration with social networks, so you are encouraged to build friendships with people you meet within the real world because the game is built upon a real world map and you go through quadrants of the real world and free them by battling monsters. And as you battle monsters, you run into other players in the real world. Um, you then add them as your, to your friends list and they can help you in battle. And in, during the battles, there are more things that pop up, such as a touch screen attack when friends are near you in the quadrant. You can use your friends to attack by touching on monsters. And it's um, very similar to something like a rhythm game where you have to tap the circles as they appear in a certain rhythm before they close. So there are there are mechanics in the game that do appear later on. However, the big secret here is that in the beta, they give you a ton of Destiny Orbs. And what our Destiny Orbs are, are the premium currency for the game, because it is a free-to-play free to play game, excuse me. And they give you a ton of them. And what these Destiny Orbs allow you to do is summon rare monsters. And the rare monsters are what you'll need to defeat some of the game's harder bosses. However, in the real version of the game, as I mentioned during the beta, these Destiny Orbs will not be afforded to you, and you'll have to pay with real money for them. Um, so you will have to wait hours to heal your party. You'll have to wait hours to gain enough currency to buy rare monsters or get them through the chance of luck. And a lot will hinge on the fact that you are not willing to pay money. Now, if you're willing to pay money, you have access to characters from other PlayStation games like Gravity Rush, and you have access to immediate access to rare monsters. However, if you're going into this with a free-to-play mentality and you're just going to go in and see what it's all about, you're going to be very disappointed because it can take up to two hours to heal your party. So if you end up dying in a battle, you can wait two hours to get your party back to play again. I don't know about you guys, but I don't always have that amount of time to play. I, I have a set amount of time I can play during that time, and then after that, I have things to do. I live a life. Yeah, um, yeah. I can't, I can't schedule a four-hour period of my life to play Destiny of Spirit. But that's yeah, just me. I, yeah, I totally understand. I think these kind of microtransactions, I don't really like them because it's, it's either nothing at all, you get nothing, or you get the whole thing without really working for it. You understand sure, what right. I'm saying? And yeah. I don't think that's all, all that fun. So I'm not really incentivized to pay for it. I'm just incentivized to delete the game. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, with, yeah. this, with the tutorial being as bad as it is, like you're saying, Brian, it opens up later on. How many people are going to download the game, play for that first sort of, you know, 20 minutes of, of sheer boringness, and then not delete it <laughs> and carry on playing to actually buy you know, these, these destiny orbs. I, I, I'm doubtful. No, you're absolutely yeah. right. I, I, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right, John. And they know how bad the tutorial is because the first thing that happens after you complete the tutorial is a survey about how bad the tutorial is. Yeah, how, exactly. They're apologizing for how bad. <laughs> so they know that something's not right with it. Yeah, I yeah. think probably the beta was used to test out the tutorial, but because they probably were unsure about it. I think, yeah, I think Destiny is not a game you're going to download and then play for 20 minutes and then think, ooh, well, I have to find this fun because I bought it, because you didn't, you didn't buy it, so you don't feel like you're obligated to have fun with it, so you're not going to play any longer after you've been put off by it. Where's the fun? Like, really, what are you doing with this game? You're playing a game where you collect spirits to battle other spirits to get more spirits for what? Yeah, there's, okay, no, there's, no, there's no goal in the game, really, other than collecting them all. If you go to, sure. like, games like Pokemon, at least, you know, there's a story, you're a trainer, you go from gym to gym, you work your way up. What's the story here? There is no story. Yeah, you're absolutely right. right. Yeah. <laughs> I think it'd be a lot more interesting if it was, like, about vodka spirits, and you could play <laughs> vodka. <laughs> <laughs> just got uh, drunker and drunker. <laughs> did you guys stay with the game long enough to experience any one of the raids? Uh, um, I think I did one of them and I got destroyed. Yeah, okay. me too. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's where the meat of the game is. They're really trying to emphasize a social structure that you'll be playing among other players. So the raids, you're facing bosses, but you're chipping away at their life, and then you want to be among those of the of your friends list to actually defeat the boss so you can coop the, the, the reward. So that's about the extent of a story you have in the game. So yeah, it's devoid completely of story, and the only story it has is the terrible tutorial. Um, so <laughs> one thing it does extremely well, and I want to see integrated into a future title, 
is the integration of the, the PlayStation characters. Um, I know it's hidden behind a paywall, and I don't like that at all. But there is something to be said about playing as Cat from Gravity Rush and using her to battle all these monsters. It's, it's actually a cool experience. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool having her in there. I mean, I didn't, <laughs> I bought like all the Gravity Rush characters or whatever, but I haven't used any of them yet. But that's because I just got too bored of the game to really continue. But maybe, maybe later I'll give it another shot. Really, they just should have made a free to play card game where you collect them all. Like, <laughs> that would have been much better than this, and it would have been more, you know, something to look at. You could have made like wallpapers out of it or something instead of having these lame spirits that don't really do much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're not animated. They're just um, just little sprites, right? Yeah. Yeah. They do look good, I think. They have but, like yeah. two frames, one that's like standing there and the other that's reaching forward to attack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then and, there, if you happen to be like a historian uh, or a history buff, all the spirits in the game are based off of international mythology. So you have Yeah, uh, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, so if you're from North America and you summon a spirit, you'll be getting a spirit from Incan mythology or whatever, or Native uh, American mythology. And if you're from Europe, it'll be subsequently the same. So that's kind of interesting. There's interesting elements, but the execution is for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if uh, you, the listener, have any thoughts on this, please email us at uh, podcast at the dot net and just say what you thought of it. Because maybe we're missing something, and you're like, "Wait a minute, this game's awesome. This is why." So let us know. Email us. Is there anything else you guys would like to add to Destiny of Spirits? No, not really. It just makes me feel a bit meh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I be- believe we're gonna go to Starlight Inception, but before we do that. Let's go to uh, Volume, which is a news story that hit just a little, not today, but a couple of days ago. Our own Brian had a story up. Uh, did you want to talk about that, Brian, or did you want me to talk about that? Well, Jasper seemed a little bit excited, so I'll let him start with it. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, for people who don't know anything about Volume, uh, Volume is a game that is currently in development by Mike Bethel. And he made uh, Thomas Was Alone, which was a two-dimensional well, puzzle platformer, which I kind of liked because it had great British narration and it made rectangles have feelings, which I thought was kind of fun. And now he's making a new game because Thomas Was Alone did very well. And uh, it's, it's called Volume. So it's basically a stealth game. And the protagonist yeah. is Robert Loxley, and he's basically sort of a Robin, Robin Hood. It's it's funny because his voice is being narrated, it's, it's being done by uh, a very famous YouTube guy. He's called uh, Charlie is so cool like on YouTube. It has Danny Wallace from the previous game from Almost Was Alone. So I'm very excited for this because it looks like an original and funny stealth game. And... I've always liked Robin Hood. The interesting uh, part about the game is not necessarily outlined in the article that I posted, but Mike Bethel had written a blog earlier in the year about volume in which he said that the game is a um, derivative of his childhood experiences with the medium. And by medium, I mean video games. There is a heavy influence of Metal Gear Solid in volume. And he said it wasn't intentional because the stealth mechanic is directly based off of uh, Metal Gear Solid. And he said it wasn't intentional, but it happens to be that it resembles Metal Gear Solid, specifically the VR missions in Metal Gear Solid 2. Um, and yeah, also from his childhood... Like, sorry? Yeah, it looks like that's a bit, too. It, yeah. it basically got this geometric look with colorful blocks. It does look a bit like VR missions, like virtual reality. And that's what it's about, too. It's about, yeah, in the future something... Someone yes. who records. So things. continue on the same tangent I was uh, going on. So oh. obviously he drew a lot of inspiration from his childhood. And another piece of literature, any one of our European uh, writers here can tell you, is that Robin Hood is a big uh, mythological creature or a character in, in English culture. And that was a character that was dear to Mike Patel's heart as a child. And so this game is kind of the the culmination of all his childhood hopes and dreams and all the things he heard when he was a child. So it's an interesting project because you can tell that Mike Mattel is pouring his heart into the game. It's just not another project that he's putting out for profit or just to have another his name out there again. There's something of him in this game. 
and that's one that's the one thing I like about it. Yeah, yeah it's definitely very interesting. Uh, I like Thomas was alone for sure, and I kept my eye on volume. So when I hear more about it, I'll definitely keep my eye on it. Eye on it, like I just said. <laughs> yeah, I um, hope that the gameplay is right this time, really, because with Thomas was alone, the gameplay was it was good, but it wasn't. It felt a bit easy and. The focus was definitely on the the story, but I think with this thing that he's doing, that it's more stealth-like, that the gameplay could definitely be spiced up a bit. Yeah, I think that's very, very cool. And then you have also that story and that very emotional feel that Thomas was alone created with the narration. I think that's going to be great. I'm really excited. Oh yeah, well, yeah, I'll definitely probably get it. Well, Go speaking, ahead, Brian, sorry. Speaking, yeah, sorry. Speaking about the narration, the narrator from Thomas was alone, Danny Wallace, is returning for volume. Uh, that was also in the announcement. But I wanted to get Tyler's um, perspective because Mike Bethel outlines the story of uh, volume as Robert Loxley, which is his version of Robin Hood in volume, becoming the world's first crime let's player. And I don't know if everybody on the listen, everybody listening knows, but Tyler is essentially a, a, a let's player. And I want to know how you feel about that. Uh, I think it's pretty cool, actually. Being, I, I've only done a few Let's Plays, and a lot of my videos are just gameplay, kind of like showing it off and getting people aware of Vita games that they might not be aware of. But yeah, I think it's pretty awesome that uh, he's given this guy you know, the opportunity to voice this character, and obviously he'll probably be doing uh, a lot of Let's Plays of it. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's pretty cool. I mean, it's giving... YouTubers, you know, the opportunity to go out and do different things, but still in the video game uh, area, which is what they're comfortable doing. So I th- feel like this guy's going to be able to do a good job at it and give other YouTubers the chance to do the same uh, thing. Awesome. Kyle, do you have anything to All say right. about it? Uh, I'm not very familiar with it, actually. I, I didn't seem like my type of game, so I kind of avoided it, to be honest. <laughs> Way to go, Kyle. <laughs> All right. He's the editor um, for large. He has lots to do. <laughs> yeah, I know. Dizzy man, dizzy man. All right, uh, Jasper. Did you have anything else to add to that, or are you good on volume? No, I'm good on volume. All right. So I believe that's the end of the news. So we could probably head on over to the preview area, where we're going to talk about uh, Tearaway, and we've already uh, talked a lot about Destiny of Spirits, and then we have Starlight Inception. So. Uh, did you want to take the Tearaway preview? Um, yeah, I mean, it's such a hard game to talk about without spoiling <laughs> things. It's it's like, it's a voyage of discovery. I mean, you play as Atwa or Iota, and the preview that I had a chance to play through had five different areas, which was a surprise in itself, because I thought it would be like one area in the demo, but it was actually about two hours that I that I played through from start to finish. Um to, to not spoil it, I mean, basically, the character that you're playing as is an envelope who has a message that's supposed to be unique to yourself. At the beginning of the game, that is like it opens as a storybook, and the narrators say that the same story has been told for generation after generation, and basically the story's getting a bit old. So what they want to do is they want to create a new and unique story that's unique to yourself as a character. So then the two worlds sort of splice together, and then your face appears in the sun. Um, on your way through, it's it's a fairly it's a fairly typical you know three dimensional platformer that it's it's fairly linear as well although there are little offshoots to the path but it's the sheer inventiveness and the creativity that goes into it it's just absolutely oozing with it i mean the world look it obviously is crafted out of paper but the way that the paper moves and the, you know there's always things animated in the background it looks so much better in motion and it's really really colorful and all of the characters um, you know the the kind of the feel of little big planet is in there um yeah but it's it's just awesome i just I, I don't want to spoil what happens throughout the journey because obviously that would spoil to everybody experiencing it but you know the it uses the the inputs in ways that feel inventive rather than obtrusive so for example the rear touchpad 
you can stick your finger up through the world and you can knock enemies over and things like that. But it's also used to move bridges and stuff like that so that you can create a path for your character through. So one minute you're controlling the character, the next minute you're using the rear touchpad in order to aid them on their quest. Um, like one, one particular section before, you do actually learn to jump, but prior to you learning to jump, there are lots of different drums that are dotted around and so you tap the rear touchpad which allows them to jump and it's all it's quite simplistic in a way and it's at least from the the preview that i played it's not a, a particularly difficult game but it's more about the experience of it it really does make you feel like a child and every single sort of you know 30 seconds even when you go through one section to the next it throws something that you're completely not expecting at you i mean there's a there's a little creation tool that's in there where you are given pieces of paper and you can you know you can draw outlines and that one of the characters will ask you what something is like for example one character says you know i really i really need a crown because i've lost mine so then it cues this little tool where you can create a crown and Although it's fairly basic, it works well with the touchscreen input. And, you know, you can add jewels to the crown and so on and so forth. And then that will then appear before you in the game. And I've tried, I mean, on my preview on the actual website, I've tried to do it in a sort of chronological order so that you can see little snippets of these creation tools and then the finished result. Um, particular surprise to me was... The, there's a snowy area where you're sort of trying to climb up a mountain and the snow is all white, it's all looking very plain and then somebody says, oh I wish the snowflakes you know, were colourful and then you create a snowflake and all of the snowflakes that are rendered in game then become that so the inventiveness is, you know, it's exceptional, it's, it's typical media molecule really, anybody who had any doubts about it needs to throw them aside I mentioned in my preview, my only doubt about the game is whether it will have the mass market appeal if it's not marketed correctly and also the longevity um the five sections that i played through once i'd finished that i mean i didn't collect everything there was but it was uh 24 percent completion it said at that point so longevity is really my only concern um but the other thing that's really really cool that i wanted to mention is Round the round the world. Once you've picked up your camera, you can you can take snapshots of things, and littered all over the place will be plain white figurines. And when you take a photo with the camera, these figurines then have the colour returned to them. And so when that happens, you can then go to the uh, the website, which is terraway.me. Unfortunately, it's not live yet, and then actually create you know all of the characters and things from within the game print off the design and then create them and so you can have them in your living room which I, I think is a really really good way of sort of you know bringing the video game to life if you like can I just jump in and say that John is now the least popular member of this staff right now because he's got to play terribly and the rest of us are jealous as well <laughs> well yeah, yeah. actually I've played it <laughs> whoa, yeah, whoa. Played it. but not to the extent of John that is Just true happened. he's got me beat we're all sitting here <laughs> well, salivating as he describes his preview <laughs> it's all jealous. Yeah, I'm oh. still. I'm kind of. Terraway looks. It looks fantastic. I mean, you have all this this papery effect. They did it so well. I saw that in the trailers, and everything bends like paper is supposed to like bend, and how paper is supposed to react to input from the world. But it it looks so natural. It looks really cute. It gives off that. Paul Paul often said that he said it gives off that Nintendo feel you know that you get like feeling a child you, you said that too i think that describes the feeling i get when i watch the trailer very well it does and, it, and it's it's just the way that it makes you feel connected as well i mean most games like little deviants for example that use the inputs it feels tacked on in a mini game sort of sense whereas with tear away they've managed to balance it so that it doesn't feel tacked on it feels like it's absolutely necessary to use the inputs which is something i've not seen before on the vita now, John, I know you haven't played Killzone, but a lot of people have been talking this year, you know, Killzone and Tearaway, those are the big games. Does Tearaway feel like a big game? Tearaway feels like the start of a new franchise that's going to be as epic as Little Big Planet, if I'm honest. I mean, at the end of my preview, I did say we could be looking at Game of the, of the Year material. From what I've seen, if they can keep it fresh and they can keep it inventive, then 
it is going to be absolutely astounding because it's such a joy to play. The only thing that is my concern is the replayability factor because obviously part of the joy of it is discovering as as you progress through the game whether they're able to then change it up so that repeated playing you know has a different message each time or whether they can make it slightly different i i don't know yet how how that's going to pan out and that's my only concern for it but i mean i was i was excited about it and i knew that it was going to be a good game, you know, because it's from Media Molecule. But when I actually played it, the the overwhelming sense of joy. There's not many games that that I'll play it and then something will happen and it will make me smile like an idiot. And <laughs> you know, and that is it's looking like this is going to be one of those games. And the other thing that I find really amazing is that the price point as well. I don't know what it is in dollars, but it's only nineteen pounds ninety nine um, available for pre order here. So it's it's half the price of some of the other titles that are coming out um but i'm i'm absolutely mega 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 excited for it yeah you've got us excited for sure (laughs) yeah yeah, but uh, just going back to that kill zone and tell rape part i think kill zone is you know the traditional game the traditional fps that we all know it it doesn't really do anything new at all but it's still very good but i think tearaway on the other hand is like I mean, it tries to really use touch inputs and, like you said, you feel connected to the game and it really tries to do something new. And I think that's quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, um, I think it's definitely something that's new to the Vita and I think, me personally, I'll be getting it day one and I'm hoping, like uh, what John was saying, that it has... You know, like the longevity where it's going to last a, a good amount of time because when you get one of these story based games, you know, when you finish it, what else is there to do? So I'm hoping that there's a lot of like little side stuff to do, which I'm sure there is. It's it's not like they're going to overlook that and let you just go play through a story and then, well, that was Tearaway. Yeah, I mean, you guys. I mean there's, there's a certain <laughs> level of replayability that's going to come anyway from, from discovering the in-game collectibles. So when I'd finished the demo, the, there were certain things that I'd missed, like I said about taking photos of the characters to get the, the templates so that you can print them off in real life. I didn't find all of them on my first way, um, playthrough. And there's also little bits of confetti that you can pick up that are littered all over the place and um, they work as an in-game currency i didn't find all of them on, on my first playthrough and they are used to um to pimp your character but also to change up other characters as well so some of them will have requests and say i'm not looking you know there's like a, a pig that says it doesn't look cute enough so you then have um a very similar tool to what you would find in a little big planet whereas you can swap in and swap out eyes and mouths and little things to decorate so there's going to be replayability in that sense in in finding all of the collectibles but then it's beyond that you know whether it's going to warrant repeated playthroughs is is you know we just don't know yet yeah it's re- it remains to be seen whether or not this is going to take off or just be kind of on the sideline not doing too much but i'm hoping it will do a lot and get a lot of people to buy it cuz i think it looks great and i think you were saying that uh it's remain like it remains to be seen whether or not it's going to have the what is it the i can't think of it the marketing there we go the marketing to uh you know, sell. But di- going back to the Killzone and Tearaway analogy that we brought up earlier, I want to say that Killzone's a fantastic game, but Killzone is an adaptation of an existing franchise, an existing genre for the PlayStation Vita platform, and admittedly does that excellently. However, Tearaway feels like the first big PlayStation Vita game, and that's with all respect to Gravity Rush. Um, this feels like a game, from what I've seen, that is made for the PlayStation Vita platform and will be this platform's version of uh, Mario 64. Uh, yeah. yeah, I understand what you're saying because, well, you said with all respect to Gravity Rush, I think when they started off Gravity Rush, they didn't think it was going to be so well loved in the Vita community because at first it was only going to be a digital release in Europe. I know that for sure because I have a little booklet from the Vita when, when it launched, and it says Gravity Rush is digital release only, but then they saw, hey, people are interested in it, so they were going to release it physical too. And 
Yeah. Now I think that Tearaway with all the touchy aspects, you know, is really being made for the theater. And I didn't like uh, Little Big Planet so much, but I I have faith in Medium Molecule. Yeah, I think it will be great. Yeah, yeah. they're a very good I, developer. Go ahead, Kyle. Sorry. I don't necessarily disagree with Brian, but I do think Gravity Rush was the first real game to take control of the Vita. Like, it didn't feel like stuff was tacked on. It felt like it was part of the experience. Mm-hmm. Um, right. But I, I, I do agree that Tearaway is, uh, in some ways, the first big game, because really Gravity Rush being the launch title, it was hard for it to be big just on the base of the Vita alone. Uh, there wasn't very many, you know, units sold within the first year. Like, we're, we're still sh- struggling to get past six million, so... It's, yeah. uh, well, not only that, you have to look at the fact that Gravity was, was under the shadow of Uncharted Golden Abyss, which was essentially the Vita's primary title when it first came out. So it never really got the shot, and it didn't really have the team behind it that Media Molecule has a big name, let's face it. And people from all walks of life, or all walks of the medium, know who Media Molecule are. Um, so when they release a game, it's much like Nintendo when they release a game. Yes right. and no, because Gravity Rush was released by Sony Japan, right? So that's a pretty big studio to be releasing a game. Yeah, yeah. No, I wasn't saying that Studio Japan was unknown, but we're, you have to understand, we're inside the industry. We're talking about people from a general perspective, a public perspective. Media Molecule is much better known. If you say the people behind Little Big Planet, it draws a lot more attention than Sony uh, of Japan. Sony Studio Japan. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else we'd like to add to uh, Tearaway? No? Okay. Uh, let's move along then. Um, up next for our previews, we have Starlight Inception, which Kyle and I got a chance to play. And I want to hear what Kyle has to say about it, because I'm pretty sure I'm the only one that really kind of enjoyed it. But before I make Kyle start talking, uh, I'll tell you guys what Starlight Inception is before you just hear what Kyle thinks about it. So I'm going to just read this off of uh, their actual Kickstarter page, just a short little paragraph about the game. So Starlight Inception is a realistic first-person, both with cockpit and without third-person strategic and tactical space combat experience. It has a unique blend of action with an involving storyline. Features include ship-based combat, both in space and on planets and moons, interplanetary exploration, and multiplayer dogfighting. So yeah, it's a space fighter game, and it has uh, multiplayer features, which is one of the big reasons why I'm interested in it. I really like multiplayer games, and I've been wanting an ace combat for the Vita, so this is kind of my my fix for that. But anyways, uh, Kyle, what did you think about this game? Yeah, I'm not really sure. See, the way that they introduce the game, they kind of throw you in like it's a tutorial, right? So right. It seems like it's the first level of the game. Um, They introduce you, you know, hey, you're a lieutenant in the Air Force or whatever it is, the the Space Force, I guess it would be. Um, And they go, here's a ship. You know, if you want to do the tutorial and figure out how to play, you can. Or you can just start off and, you know, kind of fly by the seat of your pants, I guess. Um, But the the way that they um, set up, you know, the whole attack... Uh, targeting, uh, even even the flying system, it, it's very primitive. Like, there's not a lot to it. Um, there, there's a couple menus that you can change a couple things, like uh, whether you want to, you know, push more power to your thrusters or your weapons or your defenses. Um, but, like, the core of the game is very basic. It's flying around and shooting at targets, really. So it, yeah. it's not a lot there to be, you know, critical of, I guess. Right, yeah. The the demo or beta was not very good in my opinion. Like I like the game, but the beta was not really something worth playing. Like uh like what you're saying, it has it's a tutorial, but that's pretty much all it is. If you want to play it again, you have to go through the exact same tutorial. Like you can't just hop in and just play. Like I mean, you can play, but you have to kind of ignore the tutorial, but once again, it just you go out there, you kill some things, it teaches you how to play, and then you go land your ship, and that's literally all you can do in the, the beta, which kind of sucks. I was hoping they would add maybe one more mission to kind of be like, hey, you're on your own, do what you learned, and see what happens, 
and then maybe do like a multiplayer thing, but they are a small studio being as it's a Kickstarter and it's the first uh Kickstarter game that's gonna release on the Vita, so it's pretty pretty interesting. But but yeah, it's a small studio, so I mean they don't have obviously the manpower to push out a crazy beta right away, but I don't know. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about, Kyle? Well, yeah, I, I just wanted to make a couple uh, comments on just the presentation itself. Like, the uh, the game looks okay. Um, yeah. You can tell that they've got no anti-aliasing really going on there. The uh, If you look at some of the lasers and stuff on the ship when it's loading in the first level, you can see, like, jagged. Like, the, the laser looks <laughs> jagged. So you can tell that they've, they've not smoothed out the edges or, or um, given it, you know, any superior graphical power except for the fact right. that uh, both the Earth and the Moon are clearly visible pretty much at all times and look quite quite good, the, the textures and, and the overall graphics of the, the planets and the right. well, celestial objects, I guess we'll call them, um, look pretty <laughs> good. Um, and when, when the sun comes into view, uh, when you get far, far enough away from Earth, that looks good as well. But it seems like they didn't, you know, put the graphical oomph into the, the, the actual spaceships, um, the, the spaceship you're driving, for one, um, as well as the, the carriers. They just seem real blocky and, and, and kind of ugly. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. Yeah, I agree with that. And it probably doesn't help that the game is also being developed on PC, so they're probably putting a ton of work into that and then just throwing everything onto the Vita and making it low res to work yeah so who knows if how much effort they're actually putting into the vita version so you know it remains to be seen whether or not this game is gonna pick up whenever it releases and be much better looking because it is a beta so there's a lot of stuff to be changed and that's why there's a beta to get feedback on what's bad and hopefully they take that to heart and you know make a better game because at this point on if it were to release right now i don't think i'd like it that much like i like the idea and where they're going, but I want to see them improve before it releases, definitely. Me too, and, and it seems like the, the description that they've actually given for the game, like um, I was reading some of the Kickstarter pages and just a couple other articles on it, uh, they say that you can like fly right into planets and like land on the surface and a couple other really cool things that sounded awesome, but they don't show any of that at all in the beta. It's just, you know, flying around shooting right. these stupid targets and <laughs> Very, the funny thing so is, simplistic. I, yeah, I actually tried to go land on the Earth, <laughs> but I don't think you can actually get to the Earth because yeah. I was sitting there flying for like five minutes and then the Earth wasn't getting any closer. I tried to. So I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, I turned around. I was like, yep, I'm getting farther away from everything else, but that Earth looks exactly the same size. <laughs> yeah, I, I so, don't think they added that in at all. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I. Like I was saying, it, it's a beta, so they got time to work on it, and I don't know when the, it's going to release. They said back when the Kickstarter first started um, that they were going to release it actually last month, but it's well, a Kickstarter, so... <laughs> it's It's been in the, development for, like, over a year now, so it's been a long yeah. time coming, so it should be, you know, sometime soon, whether it's in the next, you know, couple of weeks, I doubt it, but, you know, the next six yeah. months, I could definitely see it hitting the Vita. Yeah, so definitely keep an eye on that. Um, if you have, if you've backed the Kickstarter, let us know and let us know what you think about the beta. Maybe you got the PC version because you didn't want the Vita version, which would be weird because you're listening to a Vita podcast. But let us know if you uh, if you backed it and what you think of it. Uh, anyways, let's move on unless there's anything else you want to add, Kyle. Or if anyone else has any comments from what they've read or what they've seen so far. I have, yeah, I have to say, no, for me, it's just it's, it's a bit meh. It's not it's not really my sort of thing, so I, I don't really know much about it, although I am interested to see how it turns out in the end, because obviously it's the first Kickstarter Vita game potentially to release. So. Yeah. No, the only thing interesting to me is that it has a pedigree from LucasArts, which we might say rest in peace. Um, <laughs> yeah, so anything from LucasArts I can support, so I know Gary from the project is from LucasArts, so... That's the only part for me. Okay. Um, and we already talked about Destiny of Spirits, but if there's anything else we forgot to mention, then here would be the time. Anything else no. anyone wants to talk about it? No, let's exercise those spirits and move on. <laughs> okay. 
All right, then let's uh, let's head on to the reviews. Um, let's start off with well, we kind of already talked about a couple of them. Uh, Proteus, we kind of touched on about what we thought of it, so I don't think we need to double dip on that unless anyone wants to add stuff to that as well. Well, you might, you might want to actually read Paul's review. Uh, go to the site and read his review because it does explain a bit more, you know, uh, about the motivation and like the whole mood of the game. Um, I convince you to buy it, although uh, again, that price is a bit steep. Yeah. 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 So definitely go check out the website and read that review and determine whether or not it's something for you. Um. Then we have WRC four, which I believe. John, you did that one? I certainly did, yeah. And um, it's only left my beta for the first time today. Um, to, say <laughs> I'm, to say I'm hooked on it is an understatement. I mean, with, with World Rally Championship 3, it was a bare-bones experience. There was five rallies. There was, um, I think it was six stages per, per rally. And then they released three more later on as, as free downloadable content but as the trophies were tied to what was initially in the package there wasn't really a motivation to try the extra rallies if you like with world rally championship 4 it's launched with all 13 rallies there's six stages per rally and although there are certain repeated sections it, it feels like a much bigger more full experience and although i haven't played the playstation 3 version i believe that Everything in the PlayStation 3 version is in it this time. So looking at the things that they've improved upon, obviously there's all the extra content. There's now a big career mode, which is frighteningly similar to MotoGP 13, but that's not a bad thing. You start off in the junior WRC as a wildcard rider, and if you do well, then you're able to take part in the full junior WRC. And then from then you progress on to WR3, um, WRC two, and then finally the big, the big full WRC championship. So it's. I, I have a question, real quick. Yeah. Um, when you say you start off uh, in the junior thing, do you actually get to make your own person, or do you have to be a, a actual driver that's already been made? No, no, you do. You get to be your own person. Um, the first screen that you actually get in the game is for you to create your own character, although I couldn't fit my surname in because it's too long. I managed to fit <laughs> half of it in. Um, but my, my co-driver okay. in the game is, is my partner. Um, the right. manager you don't get to choose, but you also, you know, you get to do things like you can, you can change your number plate, you can select um, from a number of avatars for your driver and co-driver, although it's a fairly slim selection. But when you're playing through the career mode, every time you go to a set of stages, you'll when you have your loading screen, it will have an interview, and it's usually like the person that's in second place or just ahead of you, and they will comment on how things are going for them, and they'll say things like, I don't know what was wrong with my setup, and my, my anti-roll bars were too stiff, and I was getting lots of understeer, um, so I just couldn't catch you know, Harding, which is my name in the game. Um, and yeah. it all works very, very well, but there aren't enough variations on what they're saying, so quite quickly you'll find that they're repeating things. Although, having said that, it's, it is still a nice touch, and it, it does it does add to the experience um, somewhat. So, but but the the career mode itself, I mean, I've probably played four to six hours of the career mode, and I'm, I'm still only on WRC three at the moment. Um, so there's there's definitely a lot of longevity to be had there. Um, what I what I will say is the multiplayer experience I did have a few bugs in. Although I was able to find a match, I did notice a few connection drops. But in particular, on one stage, there's there's a picture that I've um, put in my review on the Vita Lounge, and basically what happened was I had the ghost set to on so I could see the other opponent cars, and one of the ghost cars came from behind me, and I actually crashed of my own accord. But then it flipped my car. 360 degrees and it started spinning wildly about 200 feet in the air and didn't drop for 30 seconds so that was a little Jeez. bit yeah that was a little bit concerning <laughs> it was it was very isolated um I, I didn't notice anything like that happen when i turned the ghost off so whether it's related to the ghost cars i'm not sure 
but generally speaking, it was a fairly fluid online experience. Um, you're also able to voice chat from within the lobbies and in the game, but that's accessed through touching the rear touchpad, so I noticed that yeah. I could hear people's TV in the background and things occasionally. <laughs> they obviously hadn't yeah, realised that they'd uh, yeah, that's put, annoying. That they put the microphone <laughs> on, but it, it's, it's a much better experience than last year's game. It's you know it does have a few flaws. The, the trees still look like cardboard cutouts, um, although it's not really as noticeable in motion. And the the car handling is has been massively improved. You don't really realise it unless you've played World Rally Championship three and then come to World Rally Championship four. But the handling in WRC three was quite twitchy and it was quite easy to oversteer. Whereas now the cars have a much heavier feel to them. There, you know, so you, you don't tend to oversteer as much. It means that you need to rely on the handbrake a little bit more, but they feel a lot weightier and more realistic. Um, the only, the only other downside to the game really is the junior WRC cars feel painfully slow. Like the first couple of rallies when you're a wild card rider and you do, you know, basically at the bottom, you know, with the with the weakest cars it can feel like you're sort of driving a shopping trolley around Tesco's as opposed to actually, <laughs> you know, driving at 50, 60 miles an hour. But luckily that doesn't, you know, it's only about three or four races before things open up for you. And the sense of speed in, in the full WRC is, is very, very, very good. So, Yeah, okay. I thought I've noticed when playing the demo that it did feel a lot like MotoGP 13 because, for clarity, I hadn't played WRC 3. And well, I think it's made by a different company than the guys who make MotoGP, but it did feel like it a lot, and it had the same sense of yeah, like difficult handling that you'll eventually get used to. It had the same sort of muddy graphics, but it also had lots of content. And harking back on what you said about those uh, messages, what people say that's all the same. That's the same thing with MotoGP 13. You have um, social feeds and you get emails and there's two types of emails basically and I think that has to do with basically that they want to put their money into the engine and how the car steer and well I don't really mind it but it it does give off the impression that the game is kind of low budget yeah, and, yeah. And I, I, I do agree with that I mean they were MotoGP and WRC are both made by Milestone, but they've recently switched publisher for WRC4. Uh, it's now published by Big Ben, whereas before oh, it was, oh, right. it was oh, PG. Right. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's the same developer, and okay. it's the, like you say, the career mode is, is more or less identical. Um, however, it's it's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, because the career mode does work well, but if you've played the, the two different games, you, you can see the similarities there, and you can never really forget that they created MotoGP 13 because of the similarities. But I, I wouldn't say that it hurts the experience, but no. the, the slightly lower budget, yeah, I mean, they, they don't have the budget as, uh, you know, some of the bigger bigger studios. And I, I think they've done well within the confines of what they've got. The, the car models, again, is, is something that's been massively, massively improved for this year's game. Yeah, really good. I, I, I think they've done really well uh, as making it feel like a racing simulation. Um, it's it's very good, and I'm glad that they're putting it out on Theta because, well, it doesn't seem like the obvious choice to put a racing simulation on the Vita, but I, I, I like it. I think it's very good. Yeah, and there's, pre there's precious little else when it comes to racing games at the moment, although you're not racing against opponents specifically, you're racing against the clock, but... You know, as as far as this year is concerned, it is really your only bet. It's just lucky that it's a pretty good one. It definitely seemed yeah. to me like Milestone just kind of looked at, you know, how WRC3 did and how MotoGP13 did. And when, you know, MotoGP13 did better, so let's incorporate more of that into WRC4. It works, so why not, right? Yeah, yeah that makes yeah. sense. And WRC3 was also delayed by a couple of weeks on the PlayStation Vita, which I think, I think to be honest, they may have started developing it a little bit late or not had enough resources to include everything that they wanted to into last year's game. So they, they kind of released it in, in a way that I, I don't really think they should have released it as it was. You know, it, it was just, it was just too bare of an experience and it, it just made you, 
playing World Rally Championship 3 just made you kind of miss the console versions, whereas World Rally Championship 4 feels like the console version's in your hand, which is, you know, it's basically what you want. So, uh, Who would you uh, recommend this for, uh, John? Um, I think anybody that's looking for a racing game this year, really. I mean, your only other option in the racing field is probably Need for Speed Most Wanted from last year. So... If you're looking at getting a racing game and you want something new and fresh, then definitely. If you're a World Rally Championship fan, obviously it's, it's going to be a good choice to go for as well. But if you're perhaps not as skilled at racing games, but you, you still like them and you find the difficulty a little bit high, there's also a lot of assists that you can have in the options menu. Um, you can you can change from like uh, from your left and right symbols. You can change that to sort of like a mini map of what's coming ahead. You've got um, steering assist and braking assist in there and you can also modify the computer opponent's uh, level of difficulty as well on a sliding scale from 0 to 10 so that along with the fact that you, you know the standard setup that you get before you do each rally it doesn't really need tinkering with either you can do if you want to but I, I found that the setups it gave me were good to go straight away so it's, it's very accessible in that respect plus you've also got the rewind feature as well which featured in MotoGP 13 and last year's WRC game where you can have um, you can turn it off if you want but you can have up to eight rewinds where you basically just hit triangle and then if you've mucked up a corner you can zip back about 15 seconds if, if you need to and then replay and not face any penalty so it's it's a pretty accessible game so anybody that's really interested in in racing games is it's definitely worth a go and if you played wrc3 and you felt a bit burnt by the lack of experience and the poor visuals i'd say you know don't sit on the fence do actually play wrc4 because it's it's worthy of the upgrade yeah uh what did you score it do you know uh 4.4 out of 5 very good i <laughs> i really want it but of course it's not out in the north american region yet yeah um, and unfortunately i don't know if if it will i i don't believe wrc3 did did it or it did it. yeah it took a while but it did yeah <laughs> yeah so well, there's for hope. European players, there's a demo, so you could play that if you're not sure. So don't listen to John, play the demo. <laughs> <laughs> and to be honest, the demo doesn't include some of the best tracks in the game as well. I mean, some of the some of the courses in there will will take you five or six minutes to complete. And Sweden, in particular, you know, it's set in the snowy trees, and you've got all that, and it's it's a different style of playing which again you didn't get in wrc3 there were no courses on just pure snow and ice so it's it's a really fun experience i believe that's all we have for reviews uh do we want to start going to what we've been playing guys that's with all the yeses that's... i guess i'll go for it <laughs> <laughs> uh so i've been playing a lot of stuff and before kyle interrupts me i platinum gravity rush boom what are you gonna do kyle what are you gonna do <laughs> <laughs> I'm checking down right yeah. now. Hold on. Oh God! Congratulations! Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, I didn't realize how close I was to platinuming that, so I was like, you know what? I think I'm gonna do that. So yeah, during the weekend, I uh, went crazy and I was bugging Kyle on uh, some of the trophies. So thanks, Kyle, for the help. No problem. Um, I also played a bit of Madden 13. And I know people don't like the game, but I love football, American football, so I decided to play some more of that. And obviously, Kyle and I, I think we played Killzone together this weekend. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, we killed some people. So yeah, I played a lot of Killzone, which Killzone Mercenary is amazing. I I like to destroy people on that, so I do that a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What else did I play? I know there's something. Oh, I played uh, Worms Revolution Extreme. I love me some worms. Gotta love those worms. Kyle hates the worms, but I'm gonna make him play it one day. <laughs> Not gonna happen. You're gonna have to fly. It's here. gonna happen. <laughs> it's gonna happen. Uh, and then I played a game that I hated. Uh, Lego Marvel. The Vita version is horrible, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but we could probably talk about that in our next episode or something when more people get their hands on it. But I didn't like it, so. I'll talk about that probably next episode. So uh, who who wants to go next? I'll take it next, I guess. Okay. Uh, Well, personally, I've been playing Lone Survivor a hell of a lot. Uh, I don't even think I'm close to the end, but I've been wandering around aimlessly, so it's been pretty uh, unique. (laughs) Uh, I've also been playing those betas, both Destiny Spirits and uh, Starlight Inception. Uh, Yeah, same here. I forgot. 
<laughs> yeah, of, of the two, I definitely think Starlight Inception was better, but that's not really <laughs> much. <laughs> and uh, as always, I'm playing Killzone Mercenary with Tyler at like 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, Woo! My time, anyway. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, just today, I bought Ridge Racer, which I started. So that's uh, that's pretty good, actually, so far. Yeah, you bought a full edition with all the DLC thing because it was a weirdly, weirdly split up. Basically, yeah, I, yeah. I got the full game, which was twenty five dollars on our store, and then I got the gold DLC pack, so it was like seven fifty or something like that. So I think I have either all of it or most of the good stuff anyway. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I guess so. Is that so it? I'll, oh, yeah. yeah, that's all I've been playing. All right, go ahead, Jasper. Sorry. Yeah. Um. Oh, well, I haven't been playing too much. Uh, earlier this week I was playing Pokemon Y mainly, but. This is a feature podcast, so the <laughs> last few days I've been playing uh, Batman, because I bought that. I'm going to review that soon, so don't worry about that. Um, well, So I guess I'll give a sort of an impressions about it. Um, Batman, I think it's very good. Well, it's very fun so far, and it m- basically made me re- realize a bit that Batman Arkham Asylum, which was the first game in the Arkham series, that that game is a Metroidvania game in 3D. Because this game borrows a lot of elements from Arkham Asylum. It feels like Arkham Asylum in 2D, basically. And um, it is a Metroidvania and kind of a generic one. But, yeah, yeah, it, it is, it's got some issues for sure. I mean, the map is not really that clear. And so sometimes you'll got to figure out a bit where you're going. And that's partially because the perspective in the game is not uh, flat 2D. It's basically a 3D perspective, and there are, well, many different camera angles which the game explores. 2.5D. Yeah, 2.5D, basically, what you're saying. But you can only move on a 2D plane. So it's basically 2.5D, even though there's a lot of different camera angles. Those camera angles are very nice. The game looks very good. And then you have the map, which is... It's not really... Yeah, sometimes you have a feeling that you're going around a corner in 2.5D, but then the map doesn't really show that there's some sort of corner. So it's really it's really strange. Because of the 2.5D perspective, with, which sends you in different directions, it's... So you would think that the map should be 2.5D as well, would you able to pan around? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or, or sort of more 3D, more that you ha- really have an idea where you are, because uh, that's a problem, defi- definitely a big problem with the game, because it is a metrophania, it relies a lot of on you knowing where you are and knowing where you have to go. It's not game break yeah. to me, It it's still a pretty fun game. I mean, they nailed the combat feel, you know, you have the standard punching and fighting combat from Batman, the Arkham series, they did that really well. Um, even though I'm a few hours in and I still haven't found any combat upgrades, which I find kind of disappointing because that's really fun and that isn't in here yet. I haven't found it yet. And then we have, of course, uh, the graphics. It's a shared 3DS title. It's also on 3DS. So some people were expecting the game to look quite bad because it, they thought it would be a 3DS port. Don't fear, it looks pretty good. I think it's very black and grey because you're playing in a prison and so it's quite dark. But the resolution is good and the models are good. The only thing where you can really see that it is also on 3DS, so they couldn't go full out on the graphics is in some of the close-ups of Batman, you hear some, you see some um, little glitches and low resolution textures in the background, but everything, also the animated cutscenes, especially those, really look like a comic book, which they did very well. They look, they look great. The story is very much like Arkham Asylum. Basically, some criminals took over the prison, and it's not really that interesting. But the gameplay is fun. Okay. So that's yeah. good. I'm having a good time. Is that that's good? Uh, is there anything else you played? 
Um, well, yeah, I played Destiny Spirits. Oh no! Man, we all know about <laughs> oh, that. Oh my god! <laughs> Shut up! Yeah, we Shut all up. wasted our time. <laughs> yeah, I wasted right. your time. Well, on Vita, uh, not really. No. Well, I did play on Android. I played a little game called Cytus, which is also on PlayStation Mobile, and it's a rhythm game. It's and awesome. I, yeah, it's on PlayStation Mobile. It's called Cytus Lampeter. Cytus is a rhythm game where you basically tap icons on the screen. And I find it very fun. It has music from anime style music, and I'm not really into anime at all, but I can get into the music. It's good. So check that out on PS Mobile. It should be cheap, and it's fun. All right, cool. Um, John, is there anything uh, you played? <laughs> yeah, you're going to hate me. Um, of the oh, World Rally Championship 4, I played the Tearaway Preview. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I also bought Soul Sacrifice and Killzone Mercenary, and I've yet to play them, so that's that's kind of my bad. But um, I've been <laughs> playing Hatsune Miku uh, Project Diva F, which I imported from Japan. It's... Um, a Vocaloid game, so you have lots of cute little avatars, crazy sort of graphics on the screen, and you tap the face buttons when when they come corresponding on the screen to a range of different songs. It's um it's a really really fun game. I found that it's it's also very accessible. There's, uh, I think there's about thirty something songs in it, and it's not as good as DJ Max Technica Tune, but if you like music games, it's um it's definitely a lot of fun. And I also did dug out Wipeout 2040A for the first time in a while. I don't know why, I just sort of fancy playing it and put that in and it's still as awesome as I remember and it makes me feel sad for Studio Liverpool. Um, is that all you got? Yeah, Destiny of Spirits beta. <laughs> <laughs> Spent about an hour with that, I'll never get back. Uh, I've been playing a bunch of stuff. Um, a number of them I can't really talk about at this point because I'm under embargo, but other stuff I can talk ooh. about... Ooh, yeah. So... <laughs> so uh, the stuff I can talk about, I picked up Killzone the uh, Mercenary on Vita, which Kyle has been bugging me to get. So <laughs> I finally took that. I finally, I finally jumped in, so I'm working my way through that. Um, I spent a shitload of time, sorry, pardon my French, um, <laughs> with Destiny of Spirits, which you can understand my cursing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's been pretty much it. Uh, Killzone has been taking over my life. All right. Well, I guess that wraps up our what we've been playing. So let's head on over to the mail with Kyle. What do you got, Kyle? All right. We've got uh, one this week, one listener mail. Hopefully Woo! it'll be more next week, but one's good. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to read it here straight out. Uh, hey, guys. Just finished or just got finished listening to your first podcast, and I have to say you're doing a very good job. Sound quality issues aside, the content of what you're providing is pretty spot on. You all have a great rapport together, and the conversation flowed very smoothly. You didn't have a lot of the problems that a lot of podcasts have with speakers constantly talking over each other, though we're going to have that this time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) I did have one topic of conversation that I was hoping you guys could discuss. When it comes to the Vita, it seems that there are, are two schools of thought on the direction of future games. Some people want big, unique games that you can only get on the Vita. Uh, For example, Killzone, Mercenary, Tearaway, Golden Abyss. Uh, Others want to be able to play their PS3 games on the go, so Sly Cooper, Guacamelee, Dragon's Crown. Uh, Each camp swears that if Sony would just follow their path, the Vita would be a smash success. So what say you? Unique experiences or console games on the go or something else? Thanks and keep up the great work. Auto. All right. Well, first, let me say that this guy has a very good way of wording his email, so thanks for that. (laughs) I agree. (laughs) And sloppy at all. (laughs) Exactly. Um, Second of, I think what they need to do is a a balance of both, because if they just go like full out on one, people are just going to get annoyed that they're not getting the other, and if it goes the other way, you know, it's the same thing. So I think a very well balanced diet of both. T- styles of games is what they need to do. Yeah, I have to say that I agree with that. I mean, the indie the indie scene has obviously exploded on the Vita recently. Now, if you think back to 
the gaps we've had with some of the bigger retail releases because the Vita's not getting the support it should, the indie titles have been flowing in and filling that gap. So I think that there's definitely a place for both of them. And while I think Sony should be focusing their efforts on big blockbusters that will sell more Vitas and therefore garner up more third party support, these smaller indie titles are also doing phenomenally well. And, you know, sometimes it's it's nice to go into a game that doesn't completely wreck your brain that's really really intense like you know things like Killzone are fantastic but you have to concentrate really really hard on them whereas some of these smaller indie titles are, are more of like an experience I suppose so again I, I think there's definitely a place for both. Yeah, you get a yeah, note here he, uh, he says we need a mix of, of both true unique games are very important but let us be real they won't sell systems because they're uh, well known titles like they wouldn't be well known if they're unique to the Vita right? And I think right. that, that has something to do with marketing. Um, me, me and Tyler actually were talking the other day uh, uh, about how the Vita needs to be marketed more. Um, they are doing a good job. Like uh, There's some commercials and, and stuff like that out now, but we were saying that they need to like do stuff like go to malls and show off the Vita, you know, more Let's Plays, more more professional, you know, gameplay videos, stuff like that. They need to get the word out there uh, because if they did have a unique title and they showed people, I think it really would sell. Right. Tearaway. No. Show Tearaway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure. Exactly. I- Tearaway. Tearaway is a great example because, I, like you you mentioned, you know, it came from the people who did Little Big Planet. You're you're gonna get the PlayStation community right there to listen to what you're saying, uh, and then the whole idea with you know um, the game being completely unique to the Vita. That's another pull, right? So, right, yeah, it's the it's the same thing. Whereas one of the things that bugged me is back when uh, Sound Shapes came out. Um, I thought that it was just going to be a Vita game, and when they announced that it's coming to PS3, you know, that's great for all the people that own just PS3s, but I thought that was a great game to say, this is a Vita-only game, and that's where it should stay. But I, I know a lot of people didn't really care about that, but me personally, I think when you combine or uh, mix the platforms together, it makes one of the other platforms struggle, whereas obviously the Vita is not doing better than the PS3, so if you put two of the same games on the PS3 and the Vita, more people are going to go for the PS3 version. And it's the same thing with uh, Dragon's Crown. A lot of people said that Dragon's Crown shouldn't have been on the Vita. They said it should have stayed on the PS3, which I kind of disagree because I think Dragon's Crown works really well on the Vita, but I can see where they're coming from. Yeah, me too. Trying to say that. Yeah, yeah. I thought Dragon's Crown was great, and... I didn't want it to be PS3 only because I don't own a PS3. But <laughs> that aside, I think indeed the multi-platform approach, like Sony did that with, for example, PlayStation All-Stars and Sly Cooper, I think that doesn't hurt the Vita, but it doesn't help it too much because right. PlayStation All-Stars and Sly Cooper both were less good than their console versions. I mean... Aside from portability, aside from being able to well play it when other people are on the TV, there's no really, not really an incentive to get the Vita version over the PS3 version often. Double Except platinum. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't really care about platinum, but I understand there are people who do like that. Yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? So there's not really an incentive to get the Vita version. So in essence, you're not really helping the Vita too much. I, I do like it, though, because I don't have a PS3, as I said before, so I do like to play the big console games on my Vita. I would love there to be more, but I do think that right. carving out your own niche for the Vita is important, and indies right. do help, too. Oh, yeah. Coming back to the initial question, like unique spe- experiences or console games on the go, really, I think it, it, it depends on a Venn diagram and how much you put in each space, really. You have to have games that cross over because you're going to want people who, you know, play a PlayStation 3 game to be able to play that on their Vita. But then you also want unique titles as well because you have to have games that are going to draw people to that platform to play in the first place. Like, if you if you just have games that are appearing on other systems, other than the portability factor, somebody's going to say, hey, you know, I have to pay an extra $200 to play this, you know, out in, in the open when I could, you know, have Pairway or something unique to play that I would want to pull the Vita out that wouldn't have to do with the PlayStation 3, that would be a complete, unique experience 
on my Vita, and that would be something completely different to tackle. It makes it more like, you know, the portable PS3, which it's definitely not. It, it does have good graphics. It does have a lot of qualities that the PS3 has, but it's its own unique beast, really. Right. Yeah, uh, and that's one of the things they need to do to push the Vita as its own platform is give it its own experiences, but still keep it within the same ecosystem as its console counterparts. So I think a well-balanced thing would really be where it should go. If there's anything else you guys would like to add, uh, is there? Um, I'd like to say, I mean, with the indie titles, they, they are very good for Vita, but the problem that the PlayStation Vita is in is Catch-22 at the moment. It's the big you know, the big blockbuster titles that are going to sell units, you know, uh, there, there's there's lovely creativity and there are some fantastic, in, fantastic, fantastic indie titles out there. Um, but it's it's these big titles that, are, you know, along with the marketing push, that's really going to sell more Vitas. So although all these indies are good, I do feel like we're somewhat lacking in, in big blockbuster titles at the moment. And the thing with some exclusives is, like, if you were to look at Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation, that's now being moved over to the home console. So third-party publishers are saying that it's not worth developing exclusives for the PlayStation Vita because it doesn't work out, you know, in a, in a monetary sense. But then if they were to create an exclusive for the PlayStation Vita and market it as such, and it was a timed exclusive, then they could then port that to home consoles, you know, six, 12 months down the line when perhaps yeah. the PlayStation Vita's had a boost in sales and they would still reach, the, you know, more people than they would if it was just on, like, the PlayStation 3. Yeah. Yeah. I think I kind of disagree with the liberation thing though, because I think why they're making it on the PS3 is because it did really well on the Vita, and they're like, you know what? If we make this up-res version, an HD version on the PS3, we're going to get even more money. So I think if it didn't do well on the Vita, they would have ignored it and never even put it on the PS3. Yeah, no, I, t- I completely agree. But what the, the point I was getting at was really minimizing the risk because a lot of third-party developers are saying there's too much risk involved in developing for the PlayStation Vita. It costs too much money, and they don't know whether they're going to see a return. So right. although Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation was very successful on the PlayStation Vita, as as an example, if they created an exclusive for the PlayStation Vita, it would take a lot of the risk out. If they knew it was going to be a brilliant game, but it didn't perform as well as they'd like, they could then still have the option of porting it to home consoles at a much lower mm. cost. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of good points there. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think I think that they're they're kind of taking the right approach. If you if you go solely with triple A titles as your reliability factor. Um, you end up being what Nintendo was in the early 3DS days, where you have a big absence of, of major titles on your console. And um, what they're doing is, is they're sprinkling in these little indie games that are drawing attention, so we always have something to play. Unfortunately, yeah, we haven't had a, a multitude of great third uh, AAA games this year, but we have had quite a bit to play. Um, it is a, going back to what Kyle said about the Venn diagram, it's a vicious cycle. Um, what it comes down to is that creators need the public to own comp- the PlayStation Vita for them to make the games for it, and the public need there to be games for us to buy it. It's a vicious cycle, and it, I don't know how it's going to end. That's the only problem. Um, I think Tearaway is a great start. I think it's the first major draw for the public to the Vita that's a original title, and it seems like it's a reason to own the PlayStation Vita exclusively. But I think that they're on the right track with sprinkling in the indie. Yeah, I yeah. think so too. I think indeed what you said. Um, I think that's the issue that Bioshock on the Vita face because there was going to be a Bioshock, but then oh well, not enough people own a Bioshock, uh, own a Vita, so well, buy Bioshock. We're not making it yet. And I think this really, yeah, Tearaway is helping. And of course, we've had Golden Abyss which is still the best-selling Vita title so far. I'm pretty sure about that. And Killzone Mercenary is not doing so well at the moment. Um, but, of course, it's a big game. I think, indeed, the, the approach of having both, a bit of both, is, is what is, for the future of the Vita, the best, I think. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question Let's move on to contest information that Kyle has. Let's, what do we have about this contest, Kyle? Let me know. 
All right. I just wanted to mention the contest we're running through the site currently. Uh, in the last two days, we've posted two giveaways for Lone Survivor Director's Cut voucher codes, and we actually plan to give away four more. Uh, starting when day two of the giveaway ends, the European code giveaway tonight, we'll be putting up one more chance to win. You'll be able to enter starting tonight for one of two codes, one from each region, by posting in the day three giveaway post, and by emailing us the secret word SURVIVE, you can earn another chance to win. To enter for a second chance to win, simply email us at podcast at thevitalounge.net and include both the secret word SURVIVE as well as your PSN username so that we may link your second chance to your comment in the post. Good luck, guys. Awesome. That's a fun game, too, so I would highly recommend entering into this contest. All right, so let's get out of here. We've been recording for nearly two hours. This is crazy. I'm going to have a long editing day, <laughs> so I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, uh, you can find all of us on the forums at thevitalounge.net slash forums and on Twitter at the Vita Lounge. You can find myself at Mr. PS Vita Reviews. You can find Kyle at Teflon Tactics, Brian at Brian G. Sharon, John at JHR Vita Lounge, and Jasper at JASBZ. Remember to email us at the podcast at the Vita Lounge.net to have your questions answered in the show. And once again, thank you for listening and take care. Mm-hmm.